reading comes from the first chapter of John, verses 1 through 17. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him. And without Him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Him was life. And the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name... He gave the power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, the glory as of a Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. John testified to Him and cried out, This was He! Of whom I said, he who comes before me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From this fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Please join me in a prayer for my inspiration. Living God, help us so to hear your holy word that we may truly understand, that understanding we may believe, and believing we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all we do. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. So last week, we spoke about the words that Mary used. And we spoke about the ways that we use language to try to get at this huge thing we call the incarnation. Um, it reminds me of uh, a story I had the opportunity to watch um, with my old youth pastor. He, I was going to a big church, he was the high school minister, and we went on a mission trip down to Mexico. <clears throat> And while we were down in Mexico, we went to visit people in jail. Um, it's a big gospel commandment that you should pay attention to the people that are in prison. So we went down and we wanted to witness to the people who were in prison in Mexico. So I went with him and uh, there was a, a sermon. Somebody who spoke fluent Spanish was uh, giving the sermon. But afterwards, my pastor Jeff wanted to pray with the people. And this was, we were from California. California is similar to Texas in that most people have some kind of a functional knowledge of the Spanish language. You know, the, you know how to get your hamburguesa sin cebollas. But you don't necessarily know, you know, a, a complete hold of the language. So he started praying in Spanish, and, and he was praying for them. But he's, he's a preacher, so while he was praying, he started to preach. You know, and he talked about, you know, God, just bless these people because... Because, God, I know that when you were here in the world, you, you spent time with, with people just like these people, you know, who were dead fish. And that you sent them out to be dead fish to the world. Because, Jesus, you yourself, you are a dead fish. <laughs> See, he was thinking in his head. And he was trying to remember the word fisherman. Uh -oh. Which is pescador. Pescador is a fisherman. But he used the word pescador. <laughs> That's a different word, but that means dead fish. So 
So the language he used to try to get this point across, it just didn't quite connect with the people he was talking to. That's the message that I promised I would cover directly this week. The, the message of Jesus, the fisherman, who sends us out to be fishermen. Jesus, the missionary. So, uh, I went off book. I cheated. We don't normally have lectionary passages, and we had lectionary passages about the, the coming of Jesus that we read with the Advent wreath. Um, but I wanted to add to that the Gospel of John. And talk about John 1 1 because every gospel author deals with this concept of the coming of Jesus and, and with the task of introducing their audience to who Jesus is differently. You have, for instance, Mark, who just doesn't do it. He just starts you right in the middle, and Jesus is baptized, and he's already an adult, and he's he's preaching the kingdom of God. And as a result of the way Mark starts, the whole reading of Mark is this mystery. It leads the reader to ask, who is this Jesus guy? All the way through it. Well, Matthew's different. Matthew doesn't want you to wonder who this Jesus guy is. He wants you to know from the very beginning that Jesus is the son of David, that Jesus is the coming king, and he has the rightful heir to the throne of Israel. So he starts with genealogy. It tells you exactly how the family tree works straight from David. Then there's Luke, and Luke talks about the little baby who was born in a manger, and talks about how this happened. He's a historian. He wants you to know exactly what happened in what order, and, and fill in as many of the gaps as he can. That fits in with Luke's concerns and what Luke wants you to know about Jesus. And then there's John, and he does this. He focuses on God, who's made flesh. And he begins in the beginning. Very good place to start. I'm sorry, I told you guys a couple weeks ago about my singing. I'm working on it. When you start a book with the phrase, in the beginning, you know that you're referencing Genesis. I mean, it's, it's the same thing as if I were to, to come up on stage and say, Well, sit right back and you'll hear a tale. <laughs> you, you start finishing that in your head, right? You can't not. Well, it was the same way with Genesis. This was something that people had memorized. So that, you know, if you say, in the beginning, the, the response in your head immediately plays, God created the heavens and the earth. Right? So John says, in the beginning was the word. It's a, it's a strange connection to, to connect the first words of Genesis here in John. Um, but I, I think that there's, I have a theory about, about what's going on. I mean, is, is anybody else a little lost? It seems like, what do these two texts have to do with each other? The creation of heaven and earth, the birth of Jesus. But there's a rabbinical teaching called divine condescension. The rabbis, before the coming of Jesus, would wonder at this passage. They would look at, at Genesis 1, 1 through 5, and they'd say, man, this is weird. Why did God do this? Why did God create the heavens and the earth? Why did God create anything at all? Because before God created anything at all, God was everything. God decided to speak and cause there to be something in creation that was not God. Chose to create light and darkness. And to the rabbis, this was immense humility on God's part. I mean, a God who was everything, who chose to be less than everything. That kind of divine limiting. Just in order to be creative, and in order to have love, and in order to have relationship. I mean, that... That was groundbreaking. That was totally different from the other gods that people believed in around that time. And I think John sees that in Genesis 1, and he says, oh, I can use that. that that's a teaching that, that I can do something with. So he says, in the beginning, and then he weaves Jesus 
into the creation cosmology that we have in Genesis chapter 1. He starts to talk about that word that God spoke. And he talks, starts to talk about that light that God created. And he says, Jesus is the word. Jesus is the light. The light that not only was made to exist because of God, but the light that came into the world. The light that shined in the darkness. A light that became part of creation. See, God has always participated with humanity, and especially Israel. Throughout the Bible, God's been this, this interesting kind of God. This God that wants to have relationship with humans, that wants to be involved. And really for no good reason, because humans aren't good for anything compared to God. But God just enjoys that. But John takes it farther. He gives a name to that participation, and he takes it to a new level. That the word the theological the implications of this and dwelt among cannot be overstated. I mean, they are absolutely enormous. And in some ways, we take it for granted. We don't spend time thinking about that in particular, because that's our starting point. Right? Oh yeah, Jesus is God, and then we believe these things, and this is Christianity. But that wasn't the case in the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, the incarnation, incarnation is, is the, the meatification, right? You got that carne in the middle there. That, that God meatified himself was the go-to theological idea. Nowadays, the go-to theological idea is probably the resurrection, right? We talked about that on Christ the King Sunday. If I were to ask most of you, what is the most important event in the history of God? Most of you would probably say resurrection. Some of you might say crucifixion, Good Friday, right? That's when our sins were taken away. The rest of you would probably say resurrection. But in the Middle Ages, oh, there would be no question. Incarnation, the time that God became a human. And in fact, there was this guy named Abelard, and he theorized that that was the way our sins were taken away. That it wasn't really the cross that's, that's the reason we go to heaven, but that, you know, we have this humanity. We have this, this sin, and we make mistakes, and we hurt other people, and we get old, and we die, and it's, it's this problem. These humans, we're just, we're not gods, we're just not good enough to ascend to the level of God. But it's okay. It's okay, we don't have to, we don't have to worry about that, we don't have to feel guilty about that, because God became a human. And if God could be a human, and God could come to us, and God could meet us on that level, at the level of humanity, and spend time there, and it, it didn't just reject it, but it was a thing that could happen, then I guess humanity ain't that bad. Then I guess humanity is not above redemption. Does that make sense? For Abelard, as soon as Jesus came to us as God in the flesh, Everything else was a foregone conclusion. I mean, the, the crucifixion at that point, that's just setting a good example. That's just a solid example of true love. Um, and then the resurrection, yeah, because he's God. But it's that incarnation, that didn't have to happen. And the fact that it did, that sets everything else in motion, and it all falls like dominoes. Now, there's probably truth in both. I'm not here to convince you of Abelardian atonement as opposed to substitutionary atonement in that business. That's not my point. My point is, that, yeah, I, I see y'all. I'm, I'm not trying to convince you of, you know, the cross versus the incarnation. The idea is just the profundity of this. The enormousness of this idea that people have puzzled with for centuries that, you know, maybe we shouldn't just skip over the way we often do. It's worth mentioning also that it's a great Christian distinctive. I mean, that God became a human, that, that's the thing that non-Christians reject. That's the reason there are still Jewish people. Right? That, they couldn't accept that Jesus is God, because there's one God. That's the main objection that Islam has against Christianity. Right? They, they say we're tritheists, we, we don't believe in one God. If you believe that God became flesh, that's the whole ballgame. That's Christianity. But, that would be enough. 
That, that idea, if that's all John said in this first chapter, and he did, he did this cross from Genesis all the way to our own experience in Texas in the 21st century, I mean, that would be a lot of work to get done in one paragraph. But that's not all he does. John's up to something else here. Let's go back and look at the verse. Glory as of a father's only son. There's, there's son imagery that's weaved in throughout this narrative. Um, and, and some translations will say child, that's fine. It's, it's just a, it's a word that could be translated either way, right? If Jesus is male, so we usually say son, but it's uh, the, a parent with their only child. And Jesus is defined this way. Jesus is the, the child of God. But then, John says that as many, as, and, and this is an idea you're familiar with, right? This goes on elsewhere in the Gospel of John. You're, you're familiar with Jesus, the Son of God. As many as believed on his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So there's this amazing claim, this, this God that meets us in humanity, and then there's this statement that we have the opportunity to take unto ourselves one of the titles of God, one of the titles that Jesus has. Jesus is the Word. And we are called to preach the Word to every tribe, tongue, and nation. Jesus is sent by God the Father. And the first thing Jesus does in his ministry is he starts building up apostles. Apostles means sent ones, and he sends them out to do his work. So Jesus is sent, and we're sent. Jesus is the true light in this passage, the true light that enlightens every man. And we are what, according to Jesus? The light of the world. So there's this pattern here that we are to follow Jesus in the way a disciple follows a rabbi, step by step, and that what he does, we do like him. Not as well, right? A disciple is not about becoming their rabbi, surpassing their rabbi, being thinking they're greater than. That, that's not what I'm saying. But that we imitate Jesus in everything he does. And the thing that Jesus does the central and most profound attribute of Jesus that's being communicated to us in this passage is becoming flesh and pitching his tent in our space. Jesus didn't appear in clouds and crashes of thunder and lightning and say, I am the Lord. Approach me on my terms and thou wilt live. He said, I'm going to enter the daily life of my people and become one of them, not above them. And I won't just invite them to participate with me, but I will accept their invitation, even if it costs me something. And the first disciples saw that as an example to follow, and they did likewise, joining other nations and cultures adopting their customs, familiarizing themselves with their scholars and poets, finding ways to use their traditions to glorify God, all to reach them with the word. Can I get brutal with y'all for a second? We are not like the first disciples. We, as a group, are very, very bad. I'm not pointing my fingers at anybody in particular, but, but as a whole, Christians, mainline Protestants in the 21st century, we do some things well. You know, theological thinking, doctrine, we do that well. Using big words. Incarnational ministry, we mostly ignore. We build programs. We build ministries. We even put on acts of service, and they're designed to bring people here. It's called attractional ministry. It's designed to, to get people to come to us, to increase our numbers, to increase our glory. In other words, to do the exact opposite 
of what Jesus did and taught us to do at Christmas. The lion's share of most church budgets goes to buildings and building maintenance. I, I looked it up. In 2014, we spent over $3 billion, $3 billion, $150 million on buildings to worship a God that said, I dwell not in houses made with human hands. How much of the concerns of this church are about the building? About making sure that there's somebody who comes here, that we, we keep this alive. As a pulpit supply preacher, I see it every week. I've been to church after church of old historic buildings and tightly grasping hands with nothing to show for it. Four people in worship. And those four people who would be better served if they would just go to a church farther down the street. No, but this is a 100-year-old building. This is a 150-year-old building. And if we don't keep meeting here, they're going to close it down. But the tragic thing is that they're going to close it down anyway. Because at the point where a church has ceased to be the church, at the point where the church has ceased to serve its community and has become about serving itself, it's already dead. It's just a formality of that. San Saba Presbyterian Church, not so with you. It will not be this way. I always tell you every week that it is a pleasure to worship with you, and I mean it. I've seen the presence of Christ among you. I've seen the vitality in your community. I've heard you laugh at my jokes and show generosity and hospitality seen your compassion for one another. I've seen you use this space to serve this community rather than try to get the community to serve this building. I've seen your willingness to be humble and to be flexible and to learn more. And I see a bright future ahead. I, I see possibilities. I see good incarnational ministry that you're doing. I get excited about Meals on Wheels and the volunteering that you do for one another. So next week, I want to come back and share more about my own experiences of the incarnate Christ. And hopefully give some nuts and bolts and some best practices of incarnational ministry. So I hope that you will join me for that. Meanwhile, <clears throat> I want to return you to the good news of the incarnation. That the incarnation means that we can no longer regard any of us as a lost cause. Jesus came to us. Jesus became one of us. Jesus is God Almighty. Whatever tricks he has up his sleeve, they're going to work. Let's have a word of prayer. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, thank you for your ministry to us. Thank you for your mission to us. Thank you for the truth of your word and the brightness of your light. Continue to shine in our hearts long after we leave this place. For your glory, not for ours, in your holy name, amen.